So hello everyone, welcome to the Art House Open Lecture Series, which is a collaborative programme of talks by Meadow Arts and University of Worcester. This is the sixth series of Art House Open Lectures and the following talks will be on Mondays at 4.30pm. So following today's speaker is Spur on the 12th of April 2021 and Van Burke on the 19th of April 2021. If you would like to look to book places on these talks, please go to www.meadowarts.org slash events slash art house lecture series six, and you can book through our event right listings. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, artist educator Deanne Crooks. But before I properly introduce Deanne, I will just do some quick housekeeping. This talk will consist of a 20, 25 minute presentation by Deanne, a 15 minute in conversation with myself, and then a 15 minute Q&A section. Please keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the lecture so we avoid noise interference. If you'd like to ask Diana a question, please leave these in the chat and John will read these out at the end. Alternatively, you can raise your hand using the reactions function, unmute, and you can ask your question directly to Diane. So about Diane Crooks. As an artist educator, much of Deanne's practice considers the collaborative and collective experiences of others. Engaged in their practice as a form of activism rather than a teacher of art, Deanne's relationship with pedagogy and contemporary art has cultivated a strong sense of play with political, moral and emotional themes. During her fellowship with Black Hole Club and within recent commissions for the film and video umbrella, Vivid Projects and Reframed Network, Diane has been testing the praxis of contemporary art adjacent to and in harmony with blackness. Using video, performative and fine art, Diane continues to address cultural pedagogy with a focus on the oracy of marginalized persons. With an unapologetic and deliberate approach to both education and art, Diane continues to challenge the authenticity and inclusivity of her own artistic processes and the culture within British institutions. Now working with INIVA for the Contemporary Art Space Project, Diane intends on unearthing the role of identity of politics within schools, prioritizing the voices of marginalized young people, exploring what it means to take up space, cement a sense of belonging, and use artistic tools to have pivotal conversations. Diane's commitment to creating an energized learning environment is greatly anticipated. So, Without further ado, let's get on to tonight's talk. Diane, over to you. Thank you very much for introducing me. Um, my name is Diane, as you already all know. Uh, I'm an artist educator who works with various media and techniques. And honestly, I'm just really humbled to be speaking to all of you. Uh, not nervous at all, uh, just humbled. <laughs> uh, hopefully you can you, you, you won't be able to see the nerves as I go on. So just to break down what I'm really gonna be talking a little bit about today, um, I'm gonna to be talking about my practice. Uh, I'll be sharing some of my most recent work and, and also talking a little bit about the ways in which I think and work. And hopefully you can take something from that, whether you are here as a student or a creative or however you may identify. Uh, and then, I'll be chatting with Leanne as um, she just mentioned and answering any questions that you may have. So, um, with me. I'm not expecting you all to sort of like read this and I'm definitely not gonna read it out to you. Uh, but what I will be doing is just telling you a little bit about my practice. So for those of you who don't know, I have the pleasure of being part of something called the Black Hole Club. Uh, if you haven't heard of Black Hole Club, please look it up, just throw it into Google and hopefully you'll get some, some information about that. And it's basically, a, it's, it's a space for artists to come together and test ideas and collaborate and develop their practice. And when I first joined um, Black Hole Club, the producer, Kathy Wade, who like leads the club, was talking to us a bit about how to introduce ourselves to like different audiences. Um, and they said that in many cases, people are more intrigued by the conversations that you're having um, as an artist 
as opposed to just like me listing credentials and CV and stuff like that. So I'm not going to bore you with that stuff because that that kind of bores me. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, what sort of conversations I tend to have within my practice. And the areas of exploration include politicized identities, um, respectability politics, um, looking at intersectionality. Um, I also explore second generation ness, a sense of belonging and nostalgia, things like that. And I work quite collaboratively. And when I say that, I'm gonna try and be completely honest with you here, because when I was in school, all of my excuses, especially in year eight, I would say to my teachers for my behavior, my excuse would be that I just don't work well with others. And I've spent all of like secondary school just saying, I do not work well with others. And then I've got to this point in my life and I want to work well with others. So um, my practice is collaborative in that sense. And mostly it's collaborative because of how I work with students. So being an educator, I get a lot of my inspiration and generate a lot of my ideas with my learners. Um, and I collaborate as well within Black Hole Club and with some other incredible artists. I've also said that my practice is collective in a sense and I what I mean by that is really that I try to magnify not only my own voice but voices of my peers and create a reason for marginalized people to actually engage with art give people a reason to come to a gallery or to connect with art which we know that within I can only speak of, of the Midlands but I would say this this goes for across Britain there are so many cases where um, black and Asian people there's a disconnect between them and the gallery. And so a lot of the time that ownership is put onto the marginalized people as if it's their fault. You know, why aren't you coming to a gallery? Why aren't you engaging with art when there's no reason for them to actually come? For me, there, there wasn't a reason growing up and I didn't see myself reflected in the art in those spaces. And so that's kind of one of the reasons I create and why I create the way I do. So, these like little paragraph here that you can see is really just a summary of, um, of what I've said, just in case I didn't make any sense just now. Uh, so my influences, <laughs> I'm influenced by lots of different things and I'm not gonna bore you with my personal life because it's really not that exciting anyway, but I will share with you what I always challenge my own students to focus on when they're researching artists. And that's really looking at personal elements of their life that influences their actual art. So the parts of my upbringing or my background that connect to my, um, my way of working. And I've summarized this as Birmingham Bulls and Breaking Points. And this is kind of just a quick way of getting to know some of the key points within my life that has influenced how I work. Um, growing up as a Brummie has been an interesting one because I always find that there's a parallel between Birmingham being a second city and me being a middle child. I just feel like there's there's a connection there somewhere, somehow. Those of you who are from Birmingham can probably connect to that and explain it a little better than I can. Um, but there's a sense of, of yearning for belonging even within the culture within Birmingham. And I have complex relationships um, with my own identity and being a Brummie because sometimes I'm proud of it and other times I'm like no I really am not so proud of being from Birmingham so uh, yeah I think it definitely influences my practice though because one thing I will say is a lot of creatives that come from Birmingham tend to have a, a sense of humility about them there's just a sense of humility that you get when you meet creatives from the Midlands just different you know that the way in which they create the way in which they talk about their work is has a real nice um just an authentic feel to it and so I hope that my my own practice is like that and so I do feel proud of that aspect of being a Birmingham creative um and yeah just the connection between the symbol of Birmingham as the bull and my star sign which I don't know how relevant that actually is but um I just I just want to I want you to indulge me there with uh, my star sign because I'm very much proudly a Taurus. Uh, so uh, being second generation is, is a big part of my practice as well. I come from a Jamaican background and that is hugely what influences my current body of work because I find that I'm constantly searching for a sense of belonging 
you know, never really feeling British, but never feeling Jamaican and kind of trying to work out what I do feel and how I do identify and what that means for me. And so that that sense of longing and missing and searching for something and um, feeling lost within my own identity, but also having my identity politicized is a, a huge part of how I create. Um, and I also spent a brief moment in Spain. So I lived in Spain for roughly five to six months. And this influenced my creation process as well, because Spain being somewhere that's almost like a hub of where all these famous artists that we know of come from. And you've got the Picasso Museum and the Reina Sofia Museum and places like that. It means that people have a different relationship with art there, uh, especially with fine art. And I didn't I didn't quite anticipate that when when I first went there. So being there for for those six months was really quite um, exciting. It was challenging, but really exciting and, and took me back to a very traditional side of fine art. So that was that was cool. Uh, becoming an educator and I've put becoming in like little uh, speech mark things there because I think I've always probably been one, but didn't quite know it and I think being an educator plays a bigger role on my art practice than I probably give it credit for and I think that's because I struggle to differentiate the two I think that I can't be an artist without being an educator and I can't be an educator without being an artist and that's that's very simply the way in which I work like when I'm educating I have to be creative in order to engage my learners and when I'm being an artist I feel like I have to be telling a story or educating someone on something so I I kind of can't tell the difference anymore between the artist and the educator and so that's why I've I've put that in there um and I think some of my learners might be here today um but working with young people and I work mostly with ages like 16 to 20 21 ish um it's very inspiring like yeah, I just learn a lot from them and they challenge me. And that's, I end up kind of going home. And when I am working my own way, I'm trying to take my own advice and, and take inspiration from how they're thinking and their perspective on the world. So working with young people and, and working in FEs is a huge influence. I can't mention influences on my practice without mentioning the Black Arts Group. Um, and that is just as obvious as that might seem. Um, the influence that the Black Arts Group has had on my practice is, is just very simple. It's the fact that they have been having conversations about identity politics and Blackness and Britishness for, for many, many years and, and, and sort of started these conversations. And I kind of consider myself and my purpose right now as someone who's continuing those conversations um, and trying to sort of have little subcategories from that as well so yeah black arts group are, are a major influence for for what I do and how I do it so um I want to show you some recent works that I've created um that have been quite significant within my practice and I'm only going to show you like one minute of each piece um most of you I'm not sure, I'm kind of assuming here, but most or some of you would have seen these works already. If you haven't, um, please feel free to go away and watch them later on after this finishes. But I'm gonna show you a minute of each piece. And the minute that I've selected is quite intentional um, because these are significant parts of the piece that stood out for me, or I had a specific relationship with that, that minute. So I'm gonna start off showing you a minute from, Shall we go with, yeah, let's go with Break Bread With Me first. It's it's an eight minute piece and this bursary was awarded by uh, Vivid Projects for their Vivid Live TV. So they showed this in October last year, I think October or November, but I'm gonna show you one minute of it now. So bear with me while I just swap over my screens. The most intimate part is understanding and discovering how this writing, this piece of work um, connects to the people closest to me. 
when you give the place your life, your heart, your great grandchildren, you want, you deserve something in return. When you give a country five generations, you deserve more than an aisle or a super. Thank you. Thank you. That, that the section that sort of hit you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it I think I think yeah, I, I agree with the segment you deserve more. Yeah, I was funny enough, I was gonna go for the same one, but then when everyone was reading this out, this yes. one the line that got me more actually was um a box I crossed now crosses me. Uh, I don't know, it's a nice play on words. <laughs> okay, so quite a lot of it. Um, okay, so I am I just showed a minute of that. Um, and what was really quite, I don't know if you guys found that a bit weird, but I just found that weird then watching Zoom on Zoom. I don't know, but it, it kind of just weirded my brain out <laughs> for a moment. Uh, so I'll try not to do that again. But yeah, that was a piece called Break Bread With Me. And it was a collective reading of something I wrote, but I'd, I'd written this piece probably early 2020. And I asked some of my closest friends and family um, and significant people in my life to just sit and read that with me and, and to break bread, which is which is known as uh, a sense of fellowship it's it's a phrase used uh i think it stems from i know it stems from uh like a biblical background it comes from scripture and it's known and used quite a lot within christianity but even more so within um, pentecostal spaces of when you're going to have fellowship with someone when you're just going to sit and let's just chat let's eat and and unpack things and relax and and, and heal basically it's, it's a very peaceful and joyful thing to do if someone's breaking bread with you it's it's a symbol of um family in a way and so that's kind of what I did but in in a sense it was about art it was about breaking art with each other and that's what we did together for that piece and it was it was incredible and I really enjoyed it so thank you I don't know who is actually here from that but if anyone is here from that um I know a few of you are actually Thank you for, again, for helping me with that piece. So I'm gonna show you a minute of Greatish as well now. Greatish is, um, it's a very personal piece of mine and probably my most precious, that's probably the best word to use, my most precious piece that I've created in my entire career thus far. But I'm gonna share a minute with you, but I would recommend that if you haven't seen it yet, definitely go and watch it. You can watch it for free on the, FVU website. The link is actually in, in my link tree, so which I think um, Rebecca has shared very kindly. So I'm just going to share that now. One moment. I pray that you will never date someone who convinces you that you need them in order to be great. You're already great. I can feel it. And your mommy knows what love is now but only because she's felt pain. And please trust me when I tell you that I recognize a toxic relationship when I see one. So please, baby, pay very close attention to the signs. There will be so many red flags and your colleagues and peers will tell you that these red flags are just pink ones. And even when you see that St. George's flag flying proudly outside of your neighbor's window, you will realize that even the nation's flag is a red flag. I will go to this thing called your worship and then come and the sign of the next time I think it's true. Go and the other. You go in and we heard you. If we could dance out, it's not one. Because you know, it's like this. Why would you expect my answer any part of me to look like yours? Because you are white. I'm black, and I'm very proud of you. And I said, let me hear you. Let me hear you for the sunshine. And give us five minutes that you need to change. Thank you. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, let me just quickly go back onto this. That was greatish um and I always forget how how intimate that piece is but what's quite significant really that I want to share with you is that break bread with me I made roughly two months after greatish 
Uh, and this is quite noteworthy because the tones of Greatish really amplify themes of trauma and gaslighting whilst Break Bread With Me is more of an outward attempt at healing and joy and safe spaces through reading. So I kind of like to describe it as Break Bread With Me was the ointment for the wound that I had to open when making Greatish. Um, so yeah, the thing that the thing with Greatish that is that if you're not so familiar with my practice, you probably think it was made in response to the social uprising that we saw happen last summer. But actually, that assumption is kind of reflective of of what Greatish is about because racial discord is not a new thing, and the gaslighting that we experience um, often convinces people that racism is new or even worse that it doesn't exist. So. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through this other piece. So still thinking about experiences of marginalized people. I recently made some photography work for Reframed, which is a, a network based in the Midlands. Um, and I was given the brief of looking at the experiences of black and or Asian people during COVID. So this is where I took the opportunity to work with my nan again, as if she didn't already just steal the limelight in Greatish. Um, she, she's, she's more popular than I am. And I'm, I'm not mad about that, to be honest. Um, and if you've met my nan, yeah, you're welcome. So uh, the full set of images for this, this work, I can't say too much about it because it's still, it's being released, I think later this year, but keep a lookout for that. So the foundation that I build a lot of my performance and video work on is actually my writings. I'm, all, I'm always really hesitant to call them poetry or poems because I don't really feel like a poet. And I also recognize that there are rules to poetry and I'm just not ready to follow them yet. So I do write a lot and usually the process of my writing begins with poetic activity. So I use a lot of like automatic writing and free writing to start my process. Um, yeah, and I'm still working on visualizing some of my text as well. That's kind of how Break Bread With Me began because Break Bread With Me is, um, it's actually, a video version, a reading of a text I wrote called IL-15. So um, certain ways of thinking, these are just some avenues that my mind takes in order for my practice to develop the way that it has. I think a lot about identity, um, seeing my art through a black lens, which always prevents me from creating art for art's sake. Uh, and my performance art, like for example, I can't, I don't really have the privilege of performing anger without there being like another layer to that and associations to that because contextually people still uh, exist within a stereotype of the angry black woman. So when it comes to performing, I do have to think quite carefully about how these characters, these writings exist on a black body rather than just on, on a body. So um, yeah, that's, that's something I think a lot about with identity. I think about audience, nostalgia, longing and belonging. Um, about how I engage with my audience, that my work is for them and that I make art for people, but also I don't really owe people anything. And that's always a fence that I'm sitting on when I'm thinking about creating. Um, and ways of working. This, when I'm, when I'm making a piece of work or beginning to think about responding to a theme, I explore these approaches with my process. So, uh, I engage quite heavily in critique and reflection, which is something I do with the Black Hole Club. So asking other artists how they interpret my ideas and and more importantly, speaking to non-artists as well, uh, which is just incredibly valuable to me to see how non-artists feel and connect to a piece of work and actually can they connect to it? Is it accessible or am I being so abstract that only me and my little art friends understand it, which is I never want to create in that way. So. I do a lot of critique and reflection. I think a lot about speech, um, especially with my writings. I've been reading David Sutcliffe's book called British Black English, which talks a lot about Creole and slang and black vernacular, which is used a lot within British culture, but undermined as slang or non-academic. So I, I've been exploring that a lot recently. Um, and that really interests me, especially when I think about things like Ebonics and Polari, I make connections between my own ability to code switch uh, as a way of surviving and belonging. So these are just some ways of working, some sort of phrases that I use often when I'm educating and also just saying it to myself, you know, play and protect, always play, always play and, and explore, but protect, not being precious with my work, but protecting my ideas, seeing them as valuable because they are. 
So uh, yeah, they're just some ways of working. And I thought I'd just include here some images of sketchbooks, uh, some sketchbook pages that I use because I have a bit of an obsession with post-it notes. Everything I do, every idea that I am developing goes on a post-it note and it's just either all over my wall or in my sketchbook. And I use it a lot to storyboard as well. So for Greatish, that is kind of how I got all my thoughts together in one place was to use post-it notes. Um, so yeah, that's just a glimpse of the behind the scenes. I think I've waffled on for long enough. So I just wanna very quickly thank um, Leanne for inviting me and Meadow Arts, everyone at Meadow Arts and University of Worcester uh, for this opportunity to share and just discuss a little bit about um, my practice. And thank you all as well for listening to me for the last 25 minutes, I think. Um, so I do hope that wherever, whatever perspective you're coming from, you're able to take something from this uh, yeah. Also, before I hand over to Leanne, if you want to follow my practice a bit more um, and you are on social media, then you have uh, my handles there so you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. And I think my website's already been put in the chat. So, yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to leave it there. I'll hand over to you, Leanne. So can I just say thank you so much for that talk, Diane. It was absolute gold. And if everybody would like to either unmuted or muted, round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyone still clapping? No, we've got the claps out. Okay. So again, I just want to say again, thank you very much for that, Diane. It was very enjoyable. And as I said earlier, one of the spiciest designs of presentations I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'll definitely having a look at Canva after this. Yeah, but, um, this. Yeah. I just wanted to um, kind of open our discussion. I don't know, I guess more of, with more of a contemplation, perhaps, just around um, care and self-care and uh, relating it to what you said about making great-ish, that you kind of, it was kind of like opening a wound. Mm -hmm. And... I think if we do have artists on the call today that deal with their identity, we can all relate to that kind of kind of scarring that happens, you know, with dealing with, the, with those sorts of personal themes related to, to intersections within yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how you balance that self-care, that care to others through the making of, of work, through such difficult themes revolving around anxiety, gaslighting, et cetera. Yeah, um, I really appreciate that question. I think it is a hard one. And I think that's why I mentioned even in my talk that like finding that balance between what you think you owe to your audience and, and how you use art as a therapeutic tool. So um, the term art therapy is thrown around a lot and it can mean different things. But I think for me, making great to begin with was actually quite selfish uh, because it was about me expressing something that I've been trying to get off my chest for a while and I just needed to get it out and so it was that in itself was therapeutic and, and felt like it was a caring thing to do um, but yes I had to explore parts of me and topics that are traumatic to sort of relive and to talk about and I think a big part of my care specifically when making great issues was the people I had around me like speaking to people that are the closest to me. I think a few of them might be here today. They sort of know who they are, but really sharing the work with them and talking about it and unpacking the topics, not just the art side of it, because neither of them are artists in that explicit sense, but talking to them about just those topics and, and sort of um, saying, yeah, because you experienced that, didn't you? Yeah, you get it and it hurts. And, you know, so that was a really great way for me to take care of myself as well. And also just general self-care I know that kind of sounds cheesy and everyone's been saying that a lot over the last difficult year we've had but just relaxing laughing is a is a massive way for me to kind of make up for exploring those painful areas and that's kind of where break bread with me came from it was like I just want to laugh now I just want to sit with people that look like me and have come from the same experience as me and we're just going to chat and we're going to laugh and we're going to read and yeah that was a way of healing in a sense. Definitely, definitely. And I feel as though, you know, 
as you say, kind of the subject of self-care and care, but communal care as well has really come up and under a magnifying glass um, over this past year. And certainly when it comes to artistic practice, but specifically yours, and I feel like there's a communal, a communiality, I don't know if I've just invented that word, we'll see afterwards, um, around um, break bread with me, but your, the general way that you open up, I don't know, yourself to other people in a very beautiful way, you know? And so I guess it takes me on to what I really want to say. So I'm going to look at my notes properly, um, which is around how you, you've kind of, with Break Bread of bread With Me, everybody hates him at this point, let's be honest. And you were able to utilize that tool to be a beautiful, respectful um, and important space for black women to take up and to share with one another. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I'm, I'm connecting the dots too much um, and please tell me otherwise, but I suppose has that come out of what you talk about earlier of gallery spaces and institutional spaces not being there for the black community. And so that digital space is, is, is there. Yeah, absolutely. You're not connecting the dots too much at all. I think um, I've had to, I, I take on what I can manage and I do, I mean, everyone, I guess, does they, you just do what you can do, like, and that, even though it might feel small for you, it makes a difference on a larger scale. And so we all probably do it even with little stuff like recycling, you feel like, you know, there's climate change, and then you putting your plastic in there and not in there makes that small bit of difference, but it does. And I think that's kind of how I see my art in terms of, yes, trying to, even if I can only connect to the three black women in my family or something, that's enough for me that that's like okay I've still made a difference because I know for example my nan who you saw in that clip there um sh she came to my solo exhibition in 2019 and she has never been to an art gallery in her entire life and she's like 84 85 and that for me was like so emotional because it's kind of like so you've actually missed out on an incredible thing that is art. Like art is so incredible. And it's the thing that's actually helped all of us survive this entire lockdown. Let's be honest, you know, everyone was sitting there either reading, watching Netflix, listening to music, like art is around us. And yes, there's different versions of it, but the fact that set a lot of the black communities and deprived of that just because of, well, it's, there's a lot of complicated reasons to why that is, but um, I think for me it's like well I'm going to change that even if it's in my little small bubble where I'm going to represent and show people that look like me and show my family and my sisters and my friends and uh, um, and make art for them so that then when they come into this space they can connect and they can feel like they are seen and heard I think that's super important for me to protect and to care for myself for my own and I think in turn that actually has a knock-on effect on everybody else so this isn't about me just being divisive or only making art for black people. It's about having this knock on effect of anything I create is gonna benefit everybody. Whereas if, if, I, if one person is creating something um, in one way, a lot of the times the art we see in galleries currently is it does exclude people. Whereas with art that I'm making, I'm hoping that actually it does include everybody and whether you can relate to it from a racial perspective or from a, a perspective of being a woman or from being born in different places. I mean, even for yourself, Leanne, you mentioned this to me about, you know, being second generation um, Irish and that you connected to the piece and, you know, you didn't have to be black to find connection in that work. And so even though I am trying to care for and protect black people within my art, I do think that it does have a knock on effect for everybody. Most uh, definitely, most yeah. definitely. And just to share an anecdote, as soon as you brought up your Nana, um, my dad hadn't been to an art gallery at all. And um, he, he came to one of my shows and he was 67. And that's the first time he's he ever been into an art gallery or a museum. So I can really relate to that. I'm actually getting a bit teary because of it, <laughs> because of that second generation-ness that yeah. you, you bring, you making that term exist, um, validates so much of, uh, the ineffabilities I had when I was growing up around, do you know what I mean? Second generation yeah. feelings and you've got one foot in one country and another foot in another, it feels like sometimes you're being, Absolutely. you know, and I feel as though, well, yeah, that's what I feel. And I, I've just said it, sorry. It's not really good. <laughs> no, I appreciate but, that. Um, yeah. Um, so look, looking to your practice now, looking to your practice in the past and 
you know, at the big, beginning of the pandemic and here you are now, I feel as though your practice has come on about 200 miles per hour. Um, every single day, you're, you're so prolific in, in how you create, what you create, but the level of what you create and the care it innately has for everybody who touches it really. Um, and so I just wanna take some time to, con to open that up really and, and consider how the pandemic has actually helped because I don't know if a lot of people have been focusing on that, you know, how the pandemic has really helped your practice in a way. Yes, it absolutely has. And people sort of closest to me will tell you like, I know this sounds weird, but yes, last year was very difficult for everybody. And I don't wanna be insensitive to, to to that because a lot of stuff has happened and a lot of things has changed um but in terms of my practice my practice actually had like its own incredible experience last year um which I'm super grateful for um and yeah <laughs> so much changed I think because I went from being sort of someone that was working with paint a lot and working with um uh yeah mostly painting and drawing as a medium, as a technique, then going online and being indoors so much, I, I was starting to appreciate more moving image and I was trying to still find ways to connect to people because connecting to people is like the priority for me. It mm -hmm. then stopped becoming about the media. So I realized that, well, a painting, I can't really get that online the same way. I can't connect to people the same way I would if it was in a gallery space. And so I was so determined to still have those conversations that I just went with whatever was gonna fit and, and meet people where they were at. And that was moving image. That was literally just creating videos and desktop performances. Um, and doing that, I found a lot of people were connecting to it and watching it more than they would if they had to go into a gallery space. And mm -hmm. also it's 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 what we, we say safe spaces a lot, but mm -hmm. I think it was that as well. If you're watching something from your phone, you don't have to worry about going to a space that feels pretentious or, you know elite or overly white like you don't have to worry about that you don't have to dress any particular way you know one of the things that really bother me when I go to galleries is people like going, Shh, you know I, I don't understand that I don't yeah. I just can't yeah. get my head around yeah. that you have to be quiet and so if someone's watching a video of mine from their phone they don't have to be quiet they don't have to be wearing something they can just engage with it so yeah I think yeah that was probably the biggest move on my practice over the last year was moving image and, and exploring that and playing around with photography and text and writing and yeah definitely definitely and sorry if I laugh when you talk about sh the whole sh thing in gallery because when my dad actually first went into a gallery he was anything but quiet and he didn't understand <laughs> why there was a need to be quiet so I really yeah. I really see that yeah, yeah yeah I can't I don't understand it yeah. I don't understand it either I mean <laughs> you know um Okay, beautiful. Really beautiful reflections. And it's been an absolute honour to speak to you, Diane. Thank you so much. No, thank um, you for your questions. No worries at all. So um, we're coming up to quarter past five now. So I think it, um, sorry, I'm reading Larissa's message. <laughs> to down. So um, it's coming up to quarter past five now. So I was wondering, I might just hand over to uh, John so he can take us through some questions or if anybody wants to unmute and ask Diane a question directly. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And thanks so much, Diane. That was brilliant. And uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. And the first one is from Tamsin, who really said it was lovely to hear more about your work. And the question is, um, where do you plan on going with your work practice in the nearest future? Because you mentioned you wanted to work with others more. Uh, how are you going to do that? Yeah, very good question. <laughs> Very good question, because I'm asking myself the same thing. Um, I think at the moment, I've got something coming up in May, where I'm working with um, the Birmingham Institute of Fine Art, and I'm sort of exploring um, responding to work and responding to things in a collection. So that's kind of what's coming up. But in terms of my practice, I'm really trying to integrate some of my more traditional skills with the moving image so I'm playing around with how I can incorporate my paintings uh projecting them with with my writings with some of my moving image stuff like that so I'm really just uh, playing that's probably the main word that I'd say uh, I'm doing right now especially as I'm educating and, and 
teaching and stuff I I'm really trying to balance that time of you know investing in my practice but also obviously trying to keep the lights on and and prioritize my students so yeah I think in terms of working with others as well I work with I'm working with others in the Black Hole Club which is super fun um and Kathy is very sort of big on encouraging people to work together and getting artists together so as much as the school version of Deanne says I don't work well with others I'm gonna I'm gonna break out of that I'm trying to work with others this year um and collaborating with one or two people coming up as well in the next couple of months. Brilliant, thanks Diane. Uh, we've got a question from Yaz, who needs to be unmuted to ask directly, they want to ask directly. So okay. Hello everyone, uh, lovely to hear more about your practice Diane. Uh, I remember seeing your show at Centrala and um, I was just really interested in what you said about language and like the Polari language and the Creole language and things. I wondered if you could speak a bit more about that and how that relates to your practice um, and maybe how you sort of create a language with your artwork within spaces as well. Yeah, thank you. That's that's um, a big question, a good one. I think, um, first of all, yes, Yaz, I think I remember meeting you uh, at Central SL. Thank you for coming. Um, with code switching with language, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with language and I studied, I actually did uh, English language at college and then ended up teaching it for a short period of time as well. And I just find it something I'm super interested in. And that's kind of why for any of you that seen Greatish, I didn't, I didn't translate my Nan's Patois when I was subtitling it, when I was captioning it. And that was for a reason because I think there is something about the ability to code switch about language that um, is a huge part of your identity and that can often be taken from people. And I even, I'm guilty of it. Like I've spent so many years correcting my nan or even my mom when they say things differently. Being like, you don't, you don't say it like that nan. Actually proper English is this. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm actually chipping away at their identity um, by, by having this sort of this dominant Western knowledge system by kind of holding English language to this high standard and saying that anything below that or outside of that is not proper speak. And so in a lot of my work and my desktop performances, I've not, I've sort of been intentional about not watering it down and still trying to capture the essence of Patois or of black vernacular or Ebonics um, and slang using a lot of slang within um, my desktop performances as well. I've got a piece called Na, and it's like the whole the whole writing it surrounds this idea of of language, and it's almost like actually if you understand it, you understand it. That's me connecting to you because only we understand that, um, and has this sense of yeah, it just feels almost like a safe space for me to communicate to people about a certain thing um, without feeling judged. So I think that's a big way in which I'm using language. Um, within my work and I'm doing a lot more writing at the moment as well and I had a zine I've got a zine that's available which is basically a collection of just some initial writings that I've done and that's on my website that you can see but um in the new writings I'm doing I'm actually writing it exactly how I would say it and playing a lot with my speech and creole as well so I've been reading a lot about creole and um abbreviations and how we break down Black vernacular and Jamaican patwa and things like that. So yeah, I would, I hope that answered that question. In terms of art as a language, I think I've always had this interesting connection with art as language because I think that I used to really be an advocate of saying like, oh, you know, art is the best language and the most inclusive one because it transcends, you know, speech and, and um, you know, people speaking different languages and it's visual and it's so inclusive. And then as time went on, I realized that actually even within art, there are languages within that and it's not always as inclusive. And you get so much art that is super abstract and super conceptual that it does exclude people, it really does. And so um, I'm trying to use art as a language, but as one that still offers this ability to code switch within it as well. Um, you know, which is why, again, in some of my work, I will just leave it as it is. I, I made it very clear that I wanted to keep my nan's sort of speech bit as it was and write it out exactly how she said it, um, rather than turning it into English. So, yeah, I hope that answered that question. Yes, thank you. 
Great, thanks, Diane. Uh, we've got a comment and question from Sage, which is uh, so grateful for your talk. I'm a Trans Taurus Sun International student, and I was wondering what were your favorite books on belonging and activism? I'm currently reading How to Be a Craftivist by Sarah Corbett, and I need to be gentler in my practice. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, what are my favorite books on belonging and activism? My mind's literally go blank now. I have so many books. And I'm not going to lie to you and pretend I've read them all because I really haven't. Um, I do actually have a like a, a currently reading what I'm supposed to be reading list on my link tree um, that you can definitely check out. But some of the ones that I'm reading um, at the moment have been uh, Akala's Natives. Um, so what are some of my other ones? I've been also looking at John Berger's, or John Berger's uh, way of seeing as well. I know that's that's less about activism but this sense of sort of being viewed um and performing and, and being seen I know it talks about gender but I found that very transferable to race as well um what's some of the other ones that I've been reading my mind's literally gone blank now I'll have to get that link up for you but I have been uh looking a lot at some of the classics really one of my favorite ones is Toni Morrison's which is the origin of others and I think what Toni Morrison does brilliantly is because you mentioned being gentle and I think what Toni Morrison does brilliantly is challenge some of these really chunky hefty topics about belonging and, and, and sort of about activism if you will but in this very gentle tone that feels almost super intentional but not confrontational at the same time um which is something I, I hope that my work does as well where it's it's not so confrontational that people feel cancelled when they watch it or listen to it, but they feel engaged and it ropes them in rather than pushes them out. Because I don't think that's how people won't, you know, we can't learn as a community if we're sort of um, having this very intense confront confrontational approach. I think sometimes that's required. Sometimes people are just, yeah, they're idiots and they, they do require a bit of a confrontational approach. But generally we are, I'm trying to have that that similar tone to Toni Morrison where it's gentle but it addresses what it needs to address and it's very direct with it so yeah but I hope that answered your question I really do sorry that my brain's gone blank about the books I will put that link in the chat um later on thanks Diane we've got two more questions at least so okay we'll have time for more one from Julia and, and one from Rupi so but from Julia has asked uh, do you have any advice for accessing potential adult contributors for projects who may not be as easily connected as with younger people found in school setting, settings? Thanks for a great talk too. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you, Juliet. Because um, we met earlier, Juliet, so it's lovely to speak to you again. Uh, do you have any advice for accessing potential adult contributors? To be honest, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I think... I think for me, again, a lot of my connections have come from, I think we underestimate mm. the ability of just being nice. I know this sounds, I hope you don't feel like this is a cop out to your question because I don't mean it as that, but we underestimate just being a decent human being in this day and age. And a lot of my own connections and relationships that I've developed with people uh, working with and not working with young people has been through just chatting, like literally chatting and, you know, one thing leads to something else and being in Black Hole Club and then, you know, me talking to someone else and then them telling me about someone else and saying, oh, Deanne, you should speak to that person because you're very similar or you'd get on and I'm like, okay, brilliant. And then just contacting them, um, as scary as it is, I think as adults as well, we get we're not as brave to make friends in this age that we are. <laughs> we sort of don't feel as confident to do it. Whereas kids kind of just go up to someone else and say, hi, I want to be your friend. And I just think we should encourage doing that more often. Just, you know, saying to someone, hi, I like your stuff. I like what you do. Let's be friends, <laughs> um, you know, or asking them at least, you know, consent. But I, I just think that that should be really encouraged. Um, and I'm trying to do that myself more as well to make those those networking opportunities. So I think it really is just about finding mutuals and things in common and just talking to people, especially now where we can only do it online and not in person. Uh, yeah, I hope that answered your question, Juliet. Please let me know if I didn't. I'm sure you did, Dion. that's great. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rupi uh, has a question, but I think she may need to, maybe she can un 
Mute. Yeah, yeah I've unmuted. Okay, cool. Uh, I just want to say, like, I'm such a fan girl. Even though I went to uni with Diane, like, <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. I can't tell you how much I've been like begging Leanne to let me come to this talk. So I'm secretly happy that it's been online. Thank but, you. But yeah, me. anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna put my nerves to one side. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you how you feel about the word artist or the term artist because like I have so much like push and pull with like this aura that's created around being an artist and like when I'm talking to my mates and stuff they'll be like oh artist fancy like people from not from an art background or they'll be like oh you're really pretentious but I try to do the exact opposite with my artwork and so I have so much like anxiety over the word artist or calling myself that like what do you think I just wanted to know yeah ah oh, first of all thank you Rupi and yeah thinking back to our uni days together um thank you for that question I think uh, with the word artist I actually feel which I think is a the feeling that I have about that word and about a lot of things comes from again if you are a marginalized person you feel this often but with artists I feel this in particular is that I feel a lot of imposter syndrome about that word and I never really feel like I actually am an artist um especially as I didn't I'm not sure if anyone knows this but I didn't actually study art at university and so I always feel like I I'm, I'm not quite deserving of the title and in a way for a while I I was ashamed of it I, I would be ashamed to use that word I felt like I was tricking people to be like I'm an artist yeah wink wink nobody knows that I'm in disguise um but actually I've embraced that now similar to what you're saying there where I've I've actually tried to redefine what that means to my own community when I use it that it, it's less about pretension and I think the only way to do that is through how you exist as a person because what I'd like to think is that 10 years from now when people associate the word Diane and artist together, it, it has none of that other stuff around it attached to it. Um, and that I've worked so hard to remove all those different associations. Um, but yeah, I do have a weird feeling about, about the word as well. Um, I even just have a weird feeling towards my, my overall title of artist educator. I'm like, yeah, but what does that mean? And, and they mean the same thing. And it's, yeah, I'm really weird about labels, but yeah, I, I, I get that. And that's, that's how I feel. I just feel like I feel like an imposter I don't feel I feel like it has so much weight to it that name that word that yeah. I'm almost never gonna quite reach it when the fact is I am an artist because I make art you know like that it's that simple you create and you're creative you're creative it's, it's that simple but I think we overcomplicated it over the years yeah I think it comes down to like language and stuff like you said like we need to like redefine it for ourselves Take it back. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good. Do we have time for one more question? There is only one more in the chat, which looks. Which you, yeah. Okay. Great. So Emily has asked. I was wondering how you feel about people making work about groups that they aren't part of, or part of their background. For example, a white person making art about issues that black people face without having the experience firsthand. Uh, that is a great question. I think. I could probably have like two answers for that. I think on the one hand, um, it is really important that space is given to those who are actually going through it because there's so many other topics that are afforded to um, pe people who are not black um, to explore. And I think that it's so important that those, those topics are spoken about by those experiencing it. So I, 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 won't, I won't be blurry about that. But I also think that it takes, it's going to take everyone to get on board when it comes to topics about race for things to actually change. I don't think racism is a black issue. I think it's an everyone issue. You know, it's, it's, it's an issue that white people also need to address and need to speak about. So I think it's something that, yes, if you are not a black artist, making artwork about blackness is yeah I think I think the 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 way that I would approach it or advise anyone that really wanted to sort of explore that topic and talk about it and it's really they're passionate about it is rather than taking up space perhaps working with a black artist um consulting someone who does live in that experience or, or you know black people that live in that uh experience firsthand I think that's really important actually because 
space and voice is so crucial and is taken from people of color so often um, on an everyday basis that um, I think within the art world, we can't afford to do that either as well. So I've probably, I don't know how clear I've been with that, but I, yeah, I would just say, ideally, it's important that those that are experiencing it are the ones that are voicing that experience. But if it's something that you, you are passionate about, because I do think that things to do with race is, a, is an everyone issue, you definitely should have a space and opportunity to also make art about that, but perhaps working with um, somebody who actually experiences it would be better. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Emily. Great. Thanks so much, Diane. I think that's it from this, the, dis, the discussions, but there's been a, a whole host of amazingly positive <laughs> comments in the chat. Uh, so I think, are we up to time? Is that where we're at? Yeah. Can I, can I quickly just say, because I've been trying to, I haven't really read all of them, but trying to read the messages and stuff. Thank you all so much, like just being positive and, and also just giving me uh, feedback and um, support. I just appreciate all of you for coming because I really thought it would be me and Leanne just talking to each other today. I just thought <laughs> we're having a one-to-one -one chat, you know, um, just me and her. So I really appreciate so many of you coming and yeah, contributing. Thank you. Yeah, just to echo that, thank you everybody um, for turning up. I feel some real deja vu because the chat is kind of like a black hole club chat. Like everybody's there, everybody's asking questions and participating. And, um, you know, it's just it's just wonderful to have you, Diane. And thank you so much for accepting my invitation and for coming this evening to speak to us. Um, very humbled. And uh, yeah, so if anybody has any other questions, no, we're all done on questions. And it's all just thank yous, which is absolutely lovely to see. <laughs> So um, if anybody wants to come to the next talk, which is gonna be Spur on the 12th of April, um, you can sign up on our website and uh, everybody take care of each other, of themselves. And thank you so much. The recording of this lecture is gonna be uploaded in due course if you wanna rewatch it, which I don't blame you. Um, take care of yourselves, everybody and have a lovely evening.